The history that we were all taught growing up is wrong. My name is Scott Walter, and I'm a forensic geologist. There's a hidden history in this country that nobody knows about. There are pyramids here, chambers, tombs, inscriptions. They're all over this country. We're going to investigate these artifacts and sites, and we're going to get to the truth. Sometimes history isn't what we've been told. Many people think they know the story of the lost colony of Roanoke. But chances are, they don't know this. 48 clues to the case that had been sitting untouched for half a century. 48 stones inscribed with messages that could tell us exactly what happened to the lost colony of Roanoke. They're called the Dare Stones. Allegedly carved by colonist Eleanor Dare, they were scattered throughout the South. A trail of clues to the settlers' fate. All of the stones were found during the Great Depression over a period of just four years. The short time frame of discovery for so many artifacts led scholars to declare them fakes. But academics have been wrong before, and that's why I'm going to study them myself. This is the original Dare Stone found in 1937. Jim, this is an amazing stone. Can you tell me, what does it say? It talks about the, the difficult times they had for a couple of years or so. Uh, there was misery, and uh, they were attacked by Indians. There were a number of people killed. Wow. The front of the stone has a cross at the top, mm -hmm. and underneath it says Ananias Dare, and Virginia went hence unto heaven, 1591. I can read that pretty easily here. Mm -hmm. Once you tell it, it's right there. Okay. And then on the bottom, any Englishman show John White, Governor Virginia. John White is Eleanor Dare's father. And when the colonists had hard times, he goes back to England to ask his boss, Sir Walter Raleigh, for more supplies. When White finally returns, everyone had disappeared. So tell me, what is the consensus of opinion? Is this real or not? The general consensus is that this stone is fraudulent. If this stone were considered to be authentic, then all the American history textbooks would include this story of what happened to the lost colony but they do not. Well, maybe they should. That's what I intend to find out. It 
If forensic geology shows significant weathering, then there's a chance this stone is authentic and that Eleanor Dare really did carve this clue. My cursory look at this rock, it looks like a quartzite. Yes. So quartzite's very hard, very durable. It really doesn't chemically weather. It will physically weather, but it's really not going to give us a nice linear weathering profile that we might with other rocks. What I want to do is generate a three-dimensional image so we can actually look at the profile of this groove. OK, so it's a nice rounded groove. And we can add some color. And the blue is the lower depths, of course, and the red is the topographic highs. So we can get a nice uh, image here. We can get some indication of age by looking at what we call coatings or secondary deposits that get laid down both on the surface and down into the cracks and in between the, the crystals. If you look, you see these red rust areas. Yes. Sometimes you'll generate a mineral called pyrite. And when it weathers, you get rust. Yes. OK. And this is the original exterior surface of the rock. But if we look in the grooves, it gets lighter, more white. So you're getting now into the fresh, unweathered rock. It doesn't have that rust. Yes. So that, to me, would be consistent with having been in the ground for a while. Sure. I have to say, Jim, um, right now, I, I like the, the stone number one. I'm leaning towards authenticity. Very good. I said in 1979 in an interview that I thought there was a 50-50 chance that this stone was authentic. But maybe you've given me a different perspective here. Even though this dare stone, the first one found, looks authentic to me, I need to see all the others. If I see the same level of weathering on the other 47 stones as I did on the first, then they might be legitimate clues to the lost colony. And those clues paint a grisly picture of colonial life. Sickness. Misery. And finally, murder. Well, I tell you what, one of the things that jumps out at me right away, this geology here, 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 and here is different than the other stone we've already looked at. The fact that I'm seeing these different rock types could mean they're more likely to be genuine. It makes me think they were carved in the areas where they were found. This one here has what looks like some organic material and mud that might have collected over time, and it's in the grooves. Uh, this one also does, and I suppose if we looked at the others, we might see uh, evidence that these things were underwater, maybe during flood time. And you know what? I mean, that looks weathered. I mean, just my gut feel, it just looks weathered, as does this one. I mean, my god, that's weathered like crazy. Interesting. I'll tell you what, after uh, looking at these stones in here, I'm, I'm liking what I'm seeing. Do we have a, a map that shows where these artifacts were found? Yes. Okay. There's a map showing the locations. Here's the original settlement at Roanoke, and about 60, 80 miles away, the original stone was found. And then southwest down Greenville, South Carolina, 15 more stones uh, were found. 
Remaining 33 stones were found north of Atlanta, primarily. Have people questioned why these are spread out over such a large distance? People are concerned about the likelihood of this many stones found over such a long distance. The counter to that would be, here's where they were found. Something must have compelled them to travel that great distance. And you know, at that time and place, a, a stranded colony, you can imagine all kinds of things. But what's interesting is it seems, starting at Roanoke, it's almost like we have a breadcrumb trail of these stones leading to wherever they ended up. God, this is amazing. So far, I don't see any evidence that the dare stones are fake. I think it might be another case where history has it wrong. These stones could spell out where the colonists went and how they died. But why would they travel so far inland? Before I can understand the end of the story, I need to travel back to the beginning, the place where the colonists were last seen alive. There have got to be clues here, but I have no idea what they are. What I do know is that right now, I have a puzzle where none of the pieces seem to fit. So Rob, I just got back from looking at the dare stones, and geologically, I really liked what I saw. My understanding is most of these stones were carved by Eleanor Dare, and on one of the stones, she chronicles the death of her husband, and her child, Virginia. Now, was it true that Virginia was born at this site? That is the case, uh, that she was born on Roanoke Island. OK. So when the colonists first got here, what would they have had for resources? A lot of timbers for making ships, making houses and furniture. And there's also medicinal plants, such as that sassafras we see over there at the base of that pine tree. OK, I thought they used that for root beer, but actually, you're telling me medicinal purposes. OK. So there's the big question, Rob. What happened to the colonists? I know there's a lot of theories out there, but what do you think? If they left here in an organized way, eventually, they're going to fall prey to uh, an attack by native people, to bad weather, like a hurricane, if they're uh, traveling across the water. Chances are the survivors would have assimilated into local native tribes. So this brings up the whole notion of the Native Americans and the relationship that they had with them. Um, was it contentious? Was it good? What do we know about that? Not a very good relationship. They're finding that they're not welcome here. In fact, if you stray too far away from your group, you're going to likely get killed. And there was one colonist we know of who did stray away two miles along the shore crabbing, and he's found later, and he's not alive. They would learn the hard way, really. Clearly, uh, things didn't go as planned. I mean, that we can all agree on that. I keep looking down the axis of this thing here, which when I look at the enclosing walls, I think it looks like a defensive posture and maybe a lookout, or what do we think this was? Yes, that protrusion that goes out from the rest of the earthworks is going to be a good place to post someone and keep note of anything that might be worth getting concerned about. You know, when I look at this structure and these walls, this has an, an interesting, almost geometric shape to it. So there's an intelligence, obviously, but a, a strategy behind the way that they built this fort. Here's that protrusion that we just oh, talked about. Yes. There's the gate. And you know what? There definitely is a uh, geometry here. It kind of looks like a diamond. Wow. All right, what do we know so far? We know that John White went back to Europe, and three years later, he came back and they were gone. What other clues do we have that tell us anything about the colony that was found here? We've got the clues left behind by those colonists, evidently. Large letters, C-R-O-A-T-O-A-N, along the north shoreline on a palisade post that surrounded the location of the houses. 
So the word Croatoan was carved into a post here at Roanoke. I know Croatoan was the name of a Native American tribe who was friendly to the colonists, and it was also a physical place somewhere in North Carolina. Maybe this is where the colonists went after they left Roanoke. One thing is for sure, I need to check it out and get some answers. My investigation into the lost colony of Roanoke began with the Dare Stones. 48 stones with messages that could be clues telling us what happened to America's first European settlers. Some people think the stones were part of an elaborate hoax, but the weathering of the inscriptions suggests to me they're genuine. Another clue to the case cropped up in the opposite direction of where the stones were found the word Croatoan carved in a post. I'm on my way to what was once Croatoan Island, today known as Hatteras Island. I need to know if the colonists actually came here. And if they did, how this clue connects with the Dare Stones. Scott Dawson and put all this together. Okay, I if you Scott. Any questions about it? This is a, a great display here. I'm a forensic geologist and I've been investigating the Dare Stones and uh, the Lost Colony. They mentioned that some clues might be found here. I guess there was a, a carving left by the colonists. Sure. The colonists in 1587 carved out the word Croatoan on a palisade. And a palisade is a circle of what looks like telephone poles or trees that went around where the settlement was to protect them. And so the most obvious place to leave a message would be on a palisade, and that's why they put it there. Ah. And Croatoan is the name of the island we're on now which is actually where the English had lived and traded. Now they call it Hatteras, right? They call it Hatteras now. Right. And we've been digging on the Croatoan village for four years now. And But I have some things that I'd probably be interested in. I would love to see them. All That'd right. be awesome. These are glass trade beads. And they started making them around 1550. And we know that the English brought lots and lots of these things over to trade to get deer skins and pearls and tobacco. So these are datable items, right? These have a datable range, so they're prior to 1650, but we don't know exactly how old they are. Sure. This glass, however, they quit making this glass in 1600, and you can tell it's been worked and snipped with iron tools. Lead. Oh, napped, kind of like an arrowhead? Right. right, exactly. Now, this type oh, of glass yeah. would be in a, um, in a window. It's window glass. Wow. Cool. So we have here artifacts that are found in the time period, but we don't have anything that is a, a deadlock, if you will, connection to the lost colony. That's correct. We have not found Virginia Dare's pinky ring or anything of, <laughs> of that nature, but for me, the, uh, the proof is not in the archaeology. It's common sense. They went to Croatoan as they indicated. You've got a situation that these colonists are walking into where the Indians on the mainland want to kill them and have attacked and killed them twice. And they actually came to this island to get help. You don't really think they were lost, do you? No, I, I think they were never lost. They came to Croatoan. The problem with your thesis, from my perspective, is that we have the Dare Stone standing squarely in, in the way of that. So what that means to me is that you've got a pretty compelling story. You've got documents, you've got artifacts, and yet we have the Dare Stones that stand in conflict with that. So to me, what seems to be um, a logical explanation for that is that perhaps the Dare Stone is fake. <laughs> well, no. to me, that's the logical that's explanation because that's, that's the one thing that doesn't fit is the stone. So all of this is wrong and the stone is correct, or no. all of this is correct and no, the stone is fake. No, there's another explanation. They split up. 
we have a strong evidentiary trail that leads to this party splitting up, one going west, the other coming south. That's where I'm at right now. Don't know much about the Stones. I don't put a lot of weight into things that come after the fact. You can argue that they split up and these different things, and all of that is just um, speculation. But as far as what is written down and what makes logical sense, going west does not make sense. The only thing that I can do is testify to factual evidence. The whole thing about, well, you know, at that time in 1937 when that stone was found, there were all these stories, romanticism, all that stuff is irrelevant. Facts are the things that carry, no, they are irrelevant. In a court of law, they're irrelevant. And so if the facts stand in the way of speculation, the facts win. The Dare Stones suggest that somebody, including Eleanor Dare, went west from the Roanoke colony. So until we can clear that up, we have to investigate. It's a little overcast right now, but uh, I should be heading out of here coming your way soon. Good, good. What did you find out about the last colony? I, uh, I'll tell you what, I had a chance to look at the Dare Stones, and they are amazing. I, uh, I didn't have high expectations going into it, but the geology was varied, the weathering of the inscriptions was varied, and I have to tell you, if I had to make a call today, I would say they, they look genuine to me. Really? Wow. Amazing. The downside is I uh, was a little pissed off with one of the guys that I ran into who um, wouldn't listen to anything I had to say about the Dare Stones or the geology. He was totally convinced that the colonists came down south of Roanoke to his area and uh, absolutely was closed-minded to uh, any of the geologic work. So that was disappointing. Oh, I bet. That would be. Yeah. Well, I might have another clue for you. Oh, yeah? What's that? Did you get my email? No, I didn't. Let me just pull up my computer here. I just read this in the morning paper. It's hot off the press. You'll want to see this. Ancient map could solve colony cold case. What's this all about? This map was drawn by the colony's governor, John White. Oh, yeah. And it's just been sitting in the British Museum all this time. And someone noticed that there's a patch placed over part of North Carolina. A patch? Yeah. It might be hiding something underneath there. It says right here, this map may hold the answer to one of the most famous mysteries in American history. Well, I tell you what, if that's true, I need to see it. I mean, this could be the next clue that I need. I guess I'm not coming home right now after all. I'm going to England. I'm investigating the disappearance of the lost colony of Rona, and so far, I followed up on two leads. First, the Dare Stones. 48 stones carved with clues that suggest the colonists abandoned their settlement and moved west. The second, the word Croatoan carved on a post, which could mean they went east, the opposite direction of the Dare Stones. Now, I'm following a new lead. My wife, Janet, told me about a map drawn by the colonist governor, John White, that could turn this whole investigation on its head. Apparently, there's a mysterious patch on a map drawn by John White here in England, and I want to know what's underneath it. Maybe for the last 400 years, everyone has been looking for the lost colonists in the wrong place. So 
So, Dr. Pratt, I've been investigating the Lost Rono colony, and I spent some time looking at the Dare Stones. Mm -hmm. There are a bunch of stones that have been found beginning in 1937 up through 1940, up to 48 stones that most of them were carved by uh, Eleanor Dare that tell the story of the lost colony of Roanoke. I've heard about them. OK. I was looking to see if there was evidence of forgery, as many people have claimed, and I didn't see that. I think you can tell fakes pretty, pretty quickly. I oh, mean, yeah. You know, you can see where things have been added or weathered artificially. I, I really believe it's pretty easy to tell a Well, fake. I know it's easy to tell yeah. because I have looked at fakes, and the right. fakes reveal themselves quickly. It's the ones that are real that mm. seem to hang around. Yeah. People never quite get it right. Mm. But what I want to know today and, and talk about your area of expertise mm -hmm. is about this map that John White made. And can you tell me a little bit about that map? Well, it's called the Virginia Pars map. Okay. Um, and I believe that means Virginia country okay. in translation. And it is probably one of the earliest and most accurate for that period. They've actually um, laid a, a modern day map over the top of it. And it's very, very similar, even with all the shifting of the sand. So that's it's really accurate. That, that makes the person who made it um, qu quite an extraordinary character. And that's, that's John White. And it's probably dated sometime between 1585 and 1590 when it was engraved. Here we have a copy of the map for us to look at. So we can see the whole coastline starting um, up here in the Virginia area and coming down into North Carolina. This is Albemarle Sound and the Shawan River, and then also indicating Roanoke Island, Croatoan in red, in red yeah. to show that these might be friendly areas where the Indians were more friendly. Okay. Right at the junction of these two rivers, what's yes, that? Yes, that's the patch which uh, has recently come to light. We've, we've looked at that at the British Museum, and we also have some details here where you can see through x-ray analysis that there's actually something underneath that patch. There is, and you know what? If I look close on here, I can see something. It looks like a, a pattern. That's right. See, the x-ray analysis will reveal the drawing underneath, which is looks like a, a sort of a shape of a a star shape. With four corners, you know what? I've seen that before. I've seen something very similar. It was on Roanoke Island. Now, this is my first initial sketch. Oh, that's which, interesting. That's very similar. That kind of looks familiar, doesn't it? This was the entrance back then, and there was a push out here they thought was for defense purposes and a lookout type of thing. Could that have been a fort? Well, that's certainly a possibility. Um, certainly looking from an aerial perspective that would follow the shape of the fort. Um, but wait a minute here. OK, so could this map indicate that the colonists moved inland and did not go down to Croatoan or maybe planned to go there at some point? Yeah, I, I think that's a reasonable supposition that um, it's more protected inland. It makes a lot of sense from a strategic point as well. Right now, there are a lot of locations with clues about the lost colony. There are the 48 Dare Stones, found scattered throughout the southeast in North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia. Then, there's the original fort site on the coast of North Carolina. There's Croatoan, the island that corresponds with the clue John White found carved on a post. And finally, further inland, is the spot where the Virginia Pars map shows a hidden fort. Why would it have been covered up? Because there was huge competition between England and, and Spain at this time, and Spanish ships were in the area looking for English. So the idea that the English were getting a, ahead of the Spanish by making colonies here would have been very dangerous. So I think covering up something like a fort would make sense. You know, Stephanie, both the Dare Stones and this map suggest, in my mind, that the colonists had to have gone inland. If so, why did they do that? Could it have been because of the natives? They were in danger from them? Or could it have been some well-laid-out plan? Could it have been John White involved? Or was it his boss, Sir Walter Raleigh? Well, I think that that's plausible, and I'm sure he would have plans about how to establish a colony and how to protect it and how to keep it safe. 
But we've learned a little bit about John White, but the person I need to find out about now is this Sir Walter Raleigh. I need to know more about him. I can't help but wonder if Sir Walter Raleigh figures into this mystery somehow. He was the man behind Rona, the man handpicked by Queen Elizabeth to establish the first colony in the New World. I wonder if he had anything to do with the hidden symbol on the map. Maybe there were strategic motives in play for moving the colony, or even hiding its true location. Mark, I'm investigating the lost colony of Roanoke. And of course, the story starts over on this side of the Atlantic in England. What I really want to know is more about Sir Walter Raleigh. Sir Walter is not a lazy man. Everywhere you look, Sir Walter's hand is in the action. And that, I think, is what it makes him so interesting, so attractive. He's a true Renaissance character. He's in there at the beginning, the first phases of European involvement in what is now North Carolina. My understanding is that uh, Sir Walter Raleigh financed this colony. Yes. Is that correct? Yes. What he put we... a lot of money into the adventure. Yes. Oh, OK. During this uh, period of the latter half of the 16th century, there were other uh, people trying to establish colonies in the New World, not just Sir Walter Raleigh. Is that correct? Yes, in fact, one of them was from this very college, a man called John Dee, Dr. John Dee. He wrote advocating um, the establishment of an English or a British empire and advocating colonization. Uh, it, there were many like him. It was in the air at the time. So John Dee uh, was a British expansionist. Um, would this have been a forerunner to the uh, colony? One of Dee's arguments was that the, the English, the British, had been in North America uh, long before Columbus's voyages. And so the British did have a prior claim. His argument of the case, of course, makes it easier for Sir Walter Raleigh, Queen Elizabeth I, to claim the New World. What were Raleigh's motives for sending the colony over, do you think? Well, for his own personal motives, of course, it's, it's land and property. Well, the land grab is important for Sir Walter. He's a younger son. And in the way of things, the estates have all gone to older brothers, and, and he doesn't get anything. So now he's a favorite of the queen. He wants to make something for himself and sure. for his family. From the point of view of the state, what he's looking for is a, a military base. The other thing, of course, they're looking for is something that the land produces that is worth exploiting back home. Silver and gold would be ideal, but if you can't find those, then useful crops, useful plants, um, for example, sassafras, mm -hmm. which comes up in the early accounts as a useful plant. You know, I was just over at the colony site at, at Roanoke and, and in the area, we saw lots of sassafras. So if they're looking for sassafras, why? Well. Sassafras is a versatile plant. It can be used as a food flavoring. Um, at the time, it is also uh, given a lot of curative properties for diseases, particularly for syphilis. I know that syphilis was running rampant in England at that time. What a lot of people don't know is that some scientists believe it was a disease introduced to the continent by none other than Christopher Columbus after his voyage to the New World. At that time, Sassafras was considered the only treatment for this New World disease. One of the rumors was that the queen had syphilis. If that's true, obviously this is one way you can please the queen by treating a condition that she may have had or may not have had. Yes, this rumor comes, of course, from the idea that Henry VIII, her father, had it and so passed it on to Elizabeth. There is no evidence that the queen suffered from syphilis. So do you think that sassafras might have been a motivation for them to move inland? It might have been. Um, if, you are, if it's on the list of commodities to go and look for, then you have to go where the sassafras is. I recently looked at a map that John White made, and there's an area that's covered up with a patch. And looking carefully at underneath that patch, it appears to be a symbol of what looks like a fort. Any thoughts about that? One of those tantalizing, mysterious clues, which um, effectively we need to work further on. 
You know, when I look at that symbol on the map, what I think is that this was where John White wanted to build, or Sir Walter Raleigh wanted to build a fort. We have uh, a lot of clues here that the colony went inland. And if there's a place where the secret symbol on the map, the sassafras, and the Deerstone clues all come together, we just might find the lost colony. I'm headed to the place where I think the clues to the lost colony all converge. It's a golf course called the Scotch Hall Preserve, and it's a place that corresponds with the secret symbol on John White's map. I want to know if there's any evidence the colonists ended up building a fort here, and if there's a connection to the Dare Stones. Scott Walter. Jim Hughes, Scott. Nice to see you. Say, I'm looking into the lost colony of Roanoke. Does that ring a bell at all? Yes, sir. That's big news around here. The reason I'm here today is uh, I recently looked at a map over in England that led me to here. And uh, I'm looking into the possibility that maybe the lost colony came here. And I was wondering if I could take a look around or if it would be possible maybe you could show me. Absolutely. So uh, when was this golf course built? Golf course opened in 2009 and was recognized as one of the top 10 best new courses in the country. So that was just three years ago. A lot of earthwork was done here. Did they ever find any evidence of colonial settlement or maybe the remnants of a fort? You know, I think they moved over a million cubic yards of dirt. They dug like 12 or 13 ponds and, and all that. No evidence was ever found of a fort or any colonial settlement. Nothing at all? Nothing at all. You know, I'm not surprised, but it doesn't mean that some of the colony didn't make it out here. Beautiful spot. This is the Chowan River, and uh, back there is Salmon Creek. And Okay, and this leads out to the ocean here. Right, this is the Albemarle Sound, and if you if you follow it on out, you'll hit the Outer Banks. Okay, so this area where the map was repaired and John White drew what appears to be a symbol representing a fort is covered up, that would be here. So what do you think? Was there a fort here? Uh, there's no evidence of a fort being here, Scott. Um, I think we would have found some evidence of that or some other colonial activity, but it just hasn't appeared. A lot of people have speculated on what this covered up fort-like symbol was or is. And to be quite honest with you, I think what happened here is that this spot is where John White wanted to put a fort and wanted the colony to be, but it never happened. However, that doesn't mean that some of them didn't get here. Which brings me to the next map. And that's a modern day map. And what we have plotted on here is where the dare stones were found. Yeah. There were a total of 48 stones found over a 300-mile stretch beginning in 1937 up to about 1940. Now, here's where the first stone was found, and the only reference that we have says it was found near a town called Edenton. Right across there, right across the river on the north side. It's oh, you got to be kidding me. So we're right in the same area. My theory is right, because I believe Eleanor Dare must have known that there was going to be a colony here or a fort here. And so maybe she tried to get back to the one place that she knew her father might look for her. Wow. There's one other thing that came to mind here. The sassafras. Do you have any sassafras around here? We have a lot of sassafras. You do? That's another piece to this puzzle. The reason that sassafras would have been important to the colonists and to John White specifically is because sassafras was thought to be used for medicinal purposes, specifically in treating syphilis. I'm sure that had something to do with this whole desire to 
uh, eventually cultivate and bring back sassafras to England. It's a hell of a story, Scott. After discovering the place where the map, the stones, and the sassafras all come together, my search for the lost colony is coming to a close. But geology is key to putting this case to bed. Something I learned in my forensic study of the Dare Stones was that the original stone found in Edenton was carved on a piece of quartzite. And now I need to find out if quartzite is native to the area. If Eleanor Dare really carved these messages, she would have used whatever stones were nearby. How are you doing? Hi, I'm Scott Walter. How are you doing? Paul Walter. Okay. Nice to meet you. I'm sorry to bother you here this morning, but uh, this may seem like a strange request, but I'm interested in your rock garden, the rock specifically. What is the origin of these? Did they come from Edenton here? Yes. They did? Yeah, along the banks of the Chorn River. Okay. Is there any place nearby where I could take a look where they're actually coming out of the ground? Sure. Right out on the river there. You'll okay. see them along the banks. If Paul can show me some indigenous quartzite, it would bring me one step closer to solving this mystery. Got it. Yes, this is glacial quartzite. Finding quartzite along the riverbank in Edenton is like finding the last piece of an elaborate puzzle. Forensic geology told me that the message on the first dare stone is likely very old. The discovery of quartzite is also consistent with the message being carved on stone local to the area. And both those discoveries suggest to me that the first dare stone found, and maybe the others, are genuine. I'm convinced that the colonists moved throughout the region and left the stones behind as a breadcrumb trail, marking where they'd been. Maybe they did go to Croatoan for a time, but the stones suggest they eventually moved inland. I believe the Dare Stones should have been taken seriously a long time ago. History ignored them because they didn't fit into the story we'd been told. But now, my science tells a new story.